Evening, everybody. Welcome to this very unusual edition of Songwriting Simplified. Uh, we're not on Johnny's channel tonight. Obviously, everybody is here. We're on my channel, and there is a good reason for that. Uh, uh, Johnny has uh, an appointment, a commitment that he um, he can he back out of, so that's where he is tonight. And. Uh, so yeah, so we are here tonight. Um, so, essentially tonight is going to be a Q&A night. So the floor is entirely yours. Uh, we're going to be tackling all of your songwriting questions. So we can talk about lyrics, we can talk about inspiration, we can talk about uh, chord uh, changes, we can talk about melody writing, we can talk about arranging, we can talk about production. All of that stuff come on, comes under the umbrella of this show, which is um, Songwriting Simplified. So if you guys are up for that, then that is what we will spend the next, yeah, just under an hour doing. So um, let's get started. There are a good lot of you here tonight, or at least a good lot of you in the chat, very active in the chat. Uh, and I think it is just Bob who is first in tonight. So you are... 
for an early man. And you are awesome as well for being here to start with. And uh, we've got some sick people here as well. Um, from my reading of the chat, uh, uh, Michael has a relative in the ER, which is a little concerning. I hope everything is okay. And I hope, um, I think it's Pamela you said is in, is in the hospital. I hope she's okay. And I hope um, everything goes well there. And uh, Martin says he's not feeling very well. Now, I know that Martin has um, some uh, health conditions, some health concerns of his own uh, that he manages daily. And I guess, you know, with such conditions, we have good days, we have bad days. I know exactly what those are like um, for the health conditions that I have, uh, where we have good days and we have bad days. Uh, yes and uh they can the bad days can be very debilitating and the good days um are just a respite from the debilitating ones so uh but i'm glad you are here my friend so that is very very cool uh let's see who has a question nick is talking about the floor what about the ceiling i'm not really sure what that is all about but I'm glad Mika is here and Billy is here. Deatrice is here. Michael Johnson, obviously, because I just mentioned him. And just Bob. And uh, if I have not mentioned your name, please say hi in the chat. That would be awesome. Uh, that way I know who's here and who is not. Uh, let's see. M uh, Martin Weeks for the first question. He says, court changes. I need to ask it again. The whole C to E flat or G to E flat thing. I forgot how that works. Please review. You're going to have to be a little bit more specific about the question there. Uh, because I am not entirely sure what you mean by C to E flat or G to E flat thing. Um, other than those notes are related by the interval of a minor third in the case of C to E flat or G to E flat is related by an interval of a major third. So I'm not entirely sure what you are speaking of there. Uh, Bobby Booth is here. He says, yes, that's part of getting old, bad health. Yeah, uh, I guess it kind of is, isn't it? As we get older, we get more susceptible to certain, certain things. And our immunity goes down a wee bit. Uh, I think that's definitely true. Um, and then there are conditions that people uh, just suffer from and some you know they may have had them their entire life i have two maybe three such conditions that i have had my entire life that i have had to daily manage for these last 44 years and will have to continue to daily manage <laughs> until the day i go and join um the bebop gathering in the sky aka heaven uh, so let's see. Ken is here. He says, just finishing dinner. Awesome. Please do tell us what's on the menu, Ken. Uh, and Dietrich says, sharing is caring. Yes. Um, if you have any scraps, please do post them on the chat. Uh, <laughs> it's Royal Faciousness. My good friend Ed is here and he says, made it in. Excellent. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Martin's elaborated on his question a bit. He says, how does the chord pattern work as an alternative choice instead of traditional 1-4-1-5 patterns? Okay, you're talking about um, chord changes where you have a chord 1 to chord 4. I think you're talking about cadences, but I'm still not 100% sure. So I could be telling you completely the wrong thing here, Martin. Uh, I know that, you know, you're struggling with, with the technical terminology and that kind of thing, and that's okay. Um, I'm just... I'm still not 100% clear on what you're talking about. So, um, as far as I know, you're kind of talking a little bit about cadences. And if you don't know what a cadence is, there are a number of cadences in music. And uh, it's kind of like music's punctuation. Okay, so a perfect cadence would be like a full stop, which is where you would go chord five to chord one. Hey, let's get a piano sound today. Let's do this on a Steinway ground for once. So that would be a, a perfect cadence. 
And that's like your full stop. Related to that is the plagal cadence, which often gets known as the church or amen cadence because it's used at the end of hymns, or it certainly has been historically used at the end of hymns, so that would sound like this. Okay, and so that, that crops up a lot in hymns. Amen. So, and that's called the plagal cadence because that one goes from chord 4 to chord 1. So, chord 4, which is F in the key of C, to chord 1 which is C in the key of C. Okay, so you have chord five and chord four. Okay, and those are both uh, cadences that I would regard as a full stop, if we're gonna use the punctuation analogy, okay? And then you have the imperfect cadence, and it's imperfect because we're going the other way around. Instead of going from chord five to chord one, you flip it and you go chord one to chord five. And that's an imperfect cadence. And that would be like a comma, if we're going to use that punctuation analogy, because ultimately then it's going to come back to chord one. So you might do something like this. then you might go to chord four. And then you might go two, five, one. Okay. And you could, you could just out of those chords, you could write an entire song. You really could. So you could go chord one, five, five, one, four, and you could go four minor, and then two, five, and then you're back in one. And you could write an entire pop song just on those chord changes alone. Trust me. Uh, let's see. Um, Michael Johnson with a five dollar donation. Thank you. That is awesome. Errol says, I'd like to fire off with a question. As a non-technical guitar player and songwriter, is it correct to say that one cannot refer to as a key as G sharp, but rather as A flat? This is a really, really good question. And I'll explain why this is a really, really good question. And it is because you have touched upon something called enharmonics. A little bit of a kind of intermediate music theory term. What are enharmonics? Enharmonics are the two different ways that you can spell a note on the piano, flute, piccolo, tuba, whatever, any musical instrument. It is how we spell a different note depending upon the key that you are in. So, if you are in a key that has sharps in it, like G major, E major, A major, D major, F sharp major, C sharp major, all of these major chords and their relative minors all have sharps in their key signatures. So therefore, when you're in a sharp key, most of the time you refer to the black notes by their sharp name. So, for example, the note that you're referring to is this one here, or here, it's anywhere on the keyboard, basically. But it's the middle note of the group of three black notes. And if you are playing in the key of E, A, D, G, or F sharp, or C sharp, or any, basically, any or B even, or any of those sharp keys, you would refer to this as G sharp because that is the context for that note, okay? See, I have always said, <laughs> whether I'm debating politics, history, um, combat, military history, statistics, uh, literary, you know, literature, whether I'm kind of like debating any of those things, including music, context is king. 
And so it is with enharmonics. Context is king. So in a sharp key, you would refer to these things as their sharp name. There are, however, circumstances where you'd refer to them as a flat, and I'll come on to that in just a minute. So in a sharp key, this note is a G sharp. However, if you are in a flat key like F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, or C flat major, and they're relative minors, see, we're talking circle of fifths here, um, any of those flat keys, you refer to these black notes and some of the white notes by their flat name, okay? Funnily enough, some of these white notes too can behave as a sharp or a flat, depending upon the key that you are in. So if you are in six sharps, for example, which is G sharp major, you will find that there is a B sharp and an E sharp in the key signature, and they crop up quite a lot. Conversely, if you are in the key of C flat major, you will find obviously that you have C flats and F flats, okay? And that's, that's to do with the key signature of the, t of the piece, okay? So, uh, that is, that is a context in which white notes will have a flat or sharp name. So white notes can have three enharmonic spellings. So a B can be a B, it can be a C flat, uh, or it can be an A double sharp, believe it or not. <laughs> and that's a little bit more of an advanced music theory question, really, when you're getting onto enharmonics. That's kind of the the fun for me anyway the fun end of music theory is when you're talking about double sharps and, and double sharps and double flats and you will get those the more flats and the more sharps there are in your key signature like f sharp major or g flat major you will find that things like double sharps and double flats will crop up and they do exist it's not a joke <laughs> see a flat lowers the pitch of a note by a semitone, written and then performed. A sharp raises the pitch of a note by a semitone, played and written. Okay? But there are certain circumstances where you ne actually need to raise the pitch of a note by two semitones or two half steps, which is a whole tone. Uh, and in those, or, or lower by the same amount. And so those would be a double sharp or a double flat. And a double flat symbol is basically two flat symbols kind of squished together, one in front of the other. And the double sharp symbol is an X, a small little X in front of the, the note head. And that's, that's how you explain that. So G sharp can be A flat at the same time, okay? So... It's a little bit complicated to get your head around, but the more you kind of practically work these things out with your guitar or at the piano, you will find that things that you learn from a music theory point of view, that they, uh, you will find that they are all very, very practical. Okay, music theory isn't just head knowledge. Music theory is practical and worked out. Okay, because that's where music theory starts. Music theory starts with the practice uh, and, you know, kind of like the theoretical stuff is the explanation and the contextualizing of what you play so that you can explain it to somebody else. That's why we have music theory. Music theory is a way of communicating something that is performed so that somebody else can perform it the same way with their own personality and everything else brought into it, but fundamentally that they can perform that, that thing, that event, that musical event, in the same way, in the way that you wish them to perform it. So that's why we have music theory. That's how we, why we have things like melodic structures, harmony structures, um, and the form and structure of, of a piece of music. That's why these things exist. That's why things like enharmonics exist. That's, you know, that's why we have major chords, minor chords, diminished chords, augmented chords, altered chords, dominant uh, chords, secondary dominant chords, parallel chords, 
Okay, that's why all these things exist, is to enable somebody else to be able to perform your piece of music and to understand how it works. Because understanding is really, really important in, communica in communicating something. Um, you know, whether it's literature, whether it's poetry, whether it's prose, um, whether it's narrative, whatever it is, you need to be able to communicate something to somebody so that they can understand it and so that they can get where you're coming from and they can get what you're trying to communicate. And they can, they can either laugh when it's appropriate, cry when it's appropriate, or, you know, feel disturbed and concerned when appropriate. You can do all of that. And that's why we have music theory, because music theory helps you to have all of those tools. I mean, music theory is essentially, it's just a toolkit. It is a musician's toolkit, just like a builder has a toolkit, a carpenter has a toolkit, um, a civil engineer has a toolkit, a mechanical engineer has a toolkit, an electrical engineer has a toolkit. We have a toolkit, and that's what we call music theory. That's where your scales come from. That's where your chords come from. That's where, um, you know, texture, timbre, all of those things, pitch, melody, harmony, all of that is music theory. And those are your tools that you perform your trade with. Okay, so that was a massively long answer as to why is there an A-flat and a G-sharp? And why is it the same sounding note? Can we not just call it one or the other? Which is essentially what your question is, is, you know, why is it called A-flat when it could be a G-sharp? That Why don't we just give it one name? So I hope now that you understand a little bit more about why we don't have just one name for a note. We have to have more than one because each note has a different role and function depending upon the context. Okay, so I hope uh, I hope that answers that. Uh, let's go and see what there is in the chat. And that little pop-up can go away because it's going to annoy me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bob Studios is here. I have a qu quizzical question. Folks seem to be confused at 6-4 time signature. I can test it's not a fast waltz. If you're hitting... Uh, I'm not sure what the, the last bit there is. I can test it's not... A, well, you see, again... Here's the thing, time signatures can often have a different feeling and it's context, again, that, that, that enables you to work out what you need. Like a waltz, traditionally, is in 3-4. But a waltz can also be in 9-8. It can also be in 6-8. Anything that has um, triple... Uh, a triplet feel to it could be a waltz because a waltz is a triple time thing but most of the time it is triple simple as in it you know each um each uh beat is divisible by two okay so in three four you'd have one and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and three and and that is how most waltzes are written they're written in three because the downbeat and the harmonic motion and the structure of the melody is in three beats per bar. But you are right in that sometimes it might be 6-4, but unlikely. Most of the time it's not 6, and most of the time it's 3. And it's to do with the harmonic rhythm and the structure of such a thing as a waltz, because a waltz technically is a dance. And because it is a dance, it has a set, a set structure and a set form uh, that doesn't tend to get changed at all. Um, like, you know, if you are a ballroom dancer, for example, one of the things that you have to do in competitions is you have to dance, you have to be able to dance a Viennese waltz. Uh, and Viennese waltzes are always in three, even if the tempo is fast. Because here's the thing, when you're talking about 6-4, you're not talking about tempo. You're talking about time and the measurement thereof. 
Okay, so 6-4 basically means six quarter note beats per bar. So if we're talking about 6-8, you'd be talking about six eighth note beats in the bar. And that is the bass line for the piece of music, the bass line beat for the piece of music. That is where the pulse is at. Okay? So it may well be a fast 6-4 in some situations rather than a slow 6-8. But, you know, context again is king here. You know, when we're talking about 6-4 versus 6-8, we're talking about two abstract devices that can sound the same, but it is the context of the music that dictates whether it's going to be 6-4 or 6-8. So I hope that answers that, because that, you know, again, that's really quite a, a, a... You said it's a quizzical question, and it is. It's quite a complex one. Um, Ed says... Errol, both are correct, but A flat major is used more often because it has only four flats. G sharp major has eight, uh, it doesn't have eight sharps. Uh, however, G sharp minor is much more commonly used than A flat minor. That is correct. That is most certainly correct. Um, but, I mean, I, I think he was talking about the note rather than the key. Could be wrong, but I think he was talking more about the note G sharp as compared to the note A flat, which is all about enharmonics. But you're right that uh, you could you could write in in A flat because it's only got four flats, rather than writing in the more complicated G sharp major. Um, you know because there are more sharps. But the other thing to bear in mind here is. The reason why predominantly you would use the four flats rather than the loads of sharps is because of other instruments that you may well be performing with. It's fine if you're performing solo on a piano or a guitar because the only person that the key signature affects is you. But when you start um, working with other musicians, particularly other musicians that are playing instruments that have to be transposed, like, for example, trumpet, or an alto saxophone, or a tenor saxophone, or a baritone saxophone, or a French horn, or a tuba, or a euphonium. All of these are transposing instruments, which what it basically means is those instruments are pitched at a certain point. They are in a certain key, like uh, alto sax is in E flat major. Well, it's not major, but it's in E flat fundamentally, which basically means to um, make uh, an E flat saxophone play middle C on his chart you have to write the A above that because the instrument sounds a major sixth down from that so you have to compensate for that so if you was to write if you were to write a middle C for the alto sax he would finger the C, but what would come out of the end of the horn would be a concert E flat below middle C. Okay? So what we do because of the because of the that design built into the instrument to compensate for the fact that it sounds a major sixth lower than concert pitch is you therefore have to write up a major sixth so that uh, that cancels out the, uh, the, uh, the design of the instrument, effectively. All right, so with a trumpet, a trumpet is pitched in the key of B flat. Uh, so it's, it's not in the key of B flat, it's, ki it's pitched at B flat, I should say, because they can, be, they, they can play major and minor, it's fine. Um, but they are pitched at B flat, okay? That means, that when, again, let's pick that middle C, if you write C on a trumpet player's chart, he will press down the, the required valves to make a C, but what comes out is a B flat, a tone below it. So, again, to compensate for that, you have to write up a tone to, uh, so you have to write a D on his chart, he fingers a D, and out comes the note that you want, and that's transposing. 
So, I mean, that's kind of like a side subject that's a little bit more intermediate music, uh, music theory, possibly. Uh, but I hope it answers the question as to why you would maybe write more in A flat major rather than G sharp. Um, for that, for that reason alone, fundamentally, is that you have to consider other instruments because you may find that with um, an instrument that is in a flat key, like a, an alto saxophone or a trumpet or a trombone or something like that, that are in flat keys, you'll just be loading them up with, you know, if you're if you're writing in a sharp key, you'll be loading them up with more sharps. Um, in their in their key signature that they have to read from because you have to transpose, as I've just explained briefly that is transposing is a little complicated, um, but essentially transposing is compensating for the design of the instrument. That's all it is. Um, but, you know, if I'm writing a piece in C major and I've got horn section parts and my horn section is a trumpet, well, that means the trumpet player is in the key of D, so he has two sharps. Um, but I also have an alto saxophone. Well, um, I know from what we've just talked about that if I want him to play a C, I have to write an A. So that puts him in A major, which is three sharps. You see where I'm going with this? Uh, a tenor sax has the same transposition as a trumpet, except it's a whole octave lower. Um, but it's fundamentally the same note. So the, the tenor saxophone is in D major as well. And here's the really slightly quizzical thing about transposing is that in a popular music and jazz context, the trombone is a C instrument, which means it's a concert pitch instrument. You don't have to transpose for it. But if it's a classical or brass band situation, it's a B flat instrument. There you go. Just thought I'd chuck that in there to kind of throw you off a little bit. But but yeah, that's that's kind of that really. Uh so that's why certain keys are more used than others, because those keys are not just easier to play, but they're easier to write in for all of those instruments. You have to think very carefully when you're writing your song about the instrumentation. What instruments are you writing for? Or what instruments are you going to have in your production later down the line? Because you may well start writing your song on piano or on guitar, um, and you may think, hey, you know, I the only key I know how to play in is the key of E major. Well, that's fine. Uh, but you have to think about, hey, what if I want a tenor sax solo? Well, that's, that's also fine. But just think about this. You writing in the key of E is going to put the tenor saxophone in the key of F sharp. <laughs> so you have to think about that. Uh, you know, and for some for some tenor sax players that are that are um, accomplished at playing rock music, they might have no problem if you say, "Hey, I'm, you know, this song's in E that puts you in F sharp," and they'd be like, "That's fine." But you know, if if they are you know kind of jazz trained and jazz raised, they might struggle a little bit with the key of F sharp. Might most most good sax players can play in all 12 major keys and 12 minor keys very well. So less of a concern. But still, you have to think about it. You have to consider you have to consider that when choosing your key. It's not just about finding a key that is comfortable for your singer, but it has to be comfortable for all the other musicians that are going to be involved in, in this piece, especially if you're involving brass instruments or reed instruments or um, wood, other woodwind instruments that you might be involving. Those things, you know, clarinets and uh, bass clarinets maybe, or, you know, whatever you might want to involve, um, you have to think about those things. So I hope that kind of answers that in a very, very roundabout way. Let's see. <sighs> Uh, Mika says, YouTube search for that chord progression and the only four alternatives that really work by ThinkSpace Education. Great video on this. Uh, yeah. Interesting. That chord progression, the only four alternatives that really work. Well, I find that there are hundreds of chord 
changes that all work. Uh, Bud Boxing Tires is here, and he's apologized for being late, but you know what? You really don't need to. You really don't need to. Uh, Just Bob says, the circle of fifths revolve around 12 tones, Western music. Other styles use more than 12 tones. In Eastern, they use seven notes. Does this change how theory is applied to those styles of music? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, m uh, musics that involve m what we would call in the West microtones, that is an interval that is to us smaller than a, uh, a semitone, because what we have in the West is a system called equal temperament. Um, you know, in uh, India and Southeast Asia and Polynesia and uh, Australasian um, native uh, music, they have what we would call between the cracks notes, um, you know, microtones to our ears. And to, to a Western ear, it can sound a bit out of tune, but really it isn't. They're just singing the notes in between the notes on the piano. Um, but in Western music, to a degree, we do have microtones. And those are found in blues music predominantly. Anytime you bend a note on the guitar, anytime a vocalist sings a blue note, you know, strictly speaking, a blue note on the piano is an intro interval of a minor third. You know, that's, that's the approximation of it with equal temperament. But really, in actual fact, particularly if you listen to a really, really great blues singer, the note is somewhere between the minor and major thirds. They're kind of somewhere in, bet in between those notes. Now, on the piano, you can't do that. There are no notes between those, which is why, you know, piano players have developed a whole range of techniques for faking that between the cracks note. And some of it is when you crunch a bunch of notes together like that. Uh, and, you know, those kind of devices. Um, but so in the in West in Western music, we do have microtones. We just don't use them a lot. And when we do, they are tied very much into our system of equal temperament. So they work. But if you were to adopt something like uh, uh, Japanese uh, shakuhachi music, for example, uh, which I have heard some great music that does involve, uh, and it's Western music, but it does involve uh, Japanese shakuhachi music. Um, if you don't know what a shakuhachi is, is essentially a woodwind instrument that sounds very like to us. It sounds like a, f um, a recorder or a flute. Kind of it sounds like a, a bit in between of those two things. Uh, and it's blown straight but it has a tiny little slit opening in the headstock and uh you blow across that tiny little head that tiny little slit in the headstock it's not side blown like a flute is um it's blown straight like a clarinet um except you're blowing across this little slit hole uh and it's it's the embouchure and the technique for for making the notes is really quite challenging but if you're playing one of those instruments, um, you can you can make those microtones because they they have finger holes like on a recorder uh, at, or on a clarinet, and so you kind of you can half hole to make those microtones that that you find in in the Japanese music, um, and so there are techniques to westernize those instruments so that they play nice with an equal tempered an equal tempered system but yes there is a degree to which you would have to adjust the intonation of western instruments to fit anything that comes from that microtonal system because otherwise they don't they kind of don't fit particularly well so uh, there are applications that you can use that will, you know, if you're using something like a uh, a virtual piano, there are there are some applications you can use that will 
that will provide you with a bunch of different temperaments and different tunings, such as just intonation, Pythagore Pythagorean intonation, uh, and a whole bunch of other different tunings, like tuning to 432, 425, um, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and, you know, some musics fit that, some kind of don't. But you do have to, you know, you have to learn kind of what those little microtonal intervals are so that, you know, when you're playing them, you can make them fit the, the, the context into which you're wanting to bring them. You know, for example, if you're wanting to fuse um, oriental uh, classical music, Indian class, Hindi classical music with you know, Western, I don't know, Western jazz or, or funk or something. And I have heard Hindi funk, and it is awesome when it's done really, really well. It sounds amazing. Um, so it, it can be done, but you have to just bear in mind that one instrument is designed for one context and the others are designed for another. So there has to be some compromise, at least a bit, between the two. So that is definitely worth thinking about. Uh, Fred says I've been learning basic piano awesome knowing notes on the guitar and the piano helped a lot for me only 12 notes total so getting to know how they work is the next step for me well that's fantastic and you'll find that the more you kind of do that practically you know sit with your guitar in your lap whilst you're at the piano and kind of do a, a, a an AB between the two you'll find out how you know for as much as you find out how notes on the piano works you'll find out how notes on the guitar work as well um, I'm, I think the two will help you. Dietrich says, I would like to know more of how to use the black keys for a shortcut like you guys did. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by for a shortcut. So you will have to elaborate there at least a little bit. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little behind getting to your questions, guys. So don't worry, I will try and catch... Um, so, Deatrice, elaborate that question a wee bit and post it back in. Uh, let's see if I can find the next one. Lollipop Guild is here. Awesome. Uh, Alan Polish Sounds is here as well. Says, how do you all hope all are doing well? Howdy to you too, my friend. Uh, uh, <laughs> Ed says... People have asked if I actually make a living playing music. I tell them, well, it's actually more of a dying. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. Ken asks, how do you treat a double flat if the note is already flat by the same key signature? For example, the key of D flat major, a B double flat. Is it an A or an A flat? Great question. So if in if you are in if you are in the key of D flat major. And you find in the chart there is an, uh, a B double flat, because B is in uh, so the note B is not in the in the D flat major scale. Whoops! It is in the in the in the 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 dominant scale. So you don't find B in there. So if you if you're wanting to write a B, like if you're wanting to voice a D flat seven chord in the context of a D flat major key, you would have to write a C flat because generally speaking, a a D flat seven chord means contextually that this now becomes the 5 of the key of G-flat. Okay? Because of that tension there, that tension there wants to resolve to there. Okay? So... So, would you find a B double flat, which would be an A natural? You might find it as a passing note, and because you're in a flat key, and A natural doesn't live uh, in uh, the key of D flat, 
uh, you probably might find it written as an A natural because A flat does occur in the key of D flat. So you would see it as an accidental with a natural symbol in front of it, which kind of looks like a sharp symbol, except it's only got one up line and one down line. So it kind of looks like, uh, let me see if I can, kind of looks like that. If a sharp was to look like uh, that, sort of, I can't really do it. Uh, no, I, I can't really do it. Um, but yeah, if, if a sharp looks like a hashtag sign, there you go. If a sharp looks like a hashtag, then a natural sign looks like you've taken out one of the uprights and one of the, one of the down lines. Okay. That's kind of what a natural sign looks like. Um, so you would, if you would, if you wanted an A in the context of a flat key, an A natural in the context of a flat key, that is how you'd write it. You probably would not write it as a B double flat. Probably wouldn't, but I bet you there, you would probably find a context where you would, but by and largely, it would just be an A natural symbol. Uh, how do you treat double flat if the note is already a flat in the key signature? Um, so I hope that answers that one. It might not but I hope it does. Let's scroll down some more. Oh, yo, yo, wait, there's loads here. There's loads here that I have not got to, I don't think. Uh, uh, Martin asks, isn't it also a bit of weird silence as an A-flat note might have a slightly different physical frequency as opposed to a G-sharp? Well, they don't actually. They don't. An A sharp, sorry, an A flat and a G sharp are the same notes. They have the exact, the exact same frequency. Why? Because of equal temperament. Because of equal temperament, it is the same fundamental note. There's an A flat. There's a G sharp. What makes a G sharp a G sharp and what makes an A flat an A flat is context alone. Nothing to do with slight variations of, of frequency. It's to do with context alone that you ha you write an A flat or you write a G sharp. Nothing to do with frequency. So they actually sound exactly the same. If they did not, you, you would be limited as to what keys you could write for what groups of instruments, which is why equal temperament was invented in the first place. Equal temperament was invented to even out the distance between the 12 semitones so that when you had certain instruments playing together, it didn't sound horribly out of tune, which it would do if on a recorder, there is no equal temperament, is there's maybe just temperament, and maybe on your cello, there is just temperament, but your keyboard, which could be a harpsichord. I'm taking you back to the Baroque period, by the way, and I'm doing it deliberately. Um, your harpsichord would be tuned, perhaps, to equal temperament. Now, if that was the case, if you had just, just, and equal on different instruments, you would find that certain keys will sound fine. It would sound okay. It would sound a little bit funky, but it would sound okay. But... There are other keys where it just sounds plain bad <laughs> because there is there are intonation issues and clashes between the different instruments. Map that out across a whole orchestra. Whoa, just nearly knocked my drink over. Map that out over a whole orchestra and you have a whole host of problems and nobody will listen to your music without throwing rotten vegetables at you or screaming and running and demanding their money back. Okay, so... There is no frequency difference between a G-sharp and an A-flat. And yes, Billie Holiday was a master of those blue notes. Exactly. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay. There is a question here that's kind of, I can only see half of. Just Bob asks, would it be fair to say that Jeff Beck's style of playing using the whammy bar on every note is uh, about hitting the microtones then? 
Uh, it's real cool style he's developed. Yes, he is effectively using uh, microtones um, when he does those little whammy bar hits with the with the palm of his hand whilst he's, you know, um, I see he plays a lot of finger style on his guitar. Doesn't use a plectrum very much. Um, I saw him at Ronnie Scott's, actually. Long time ago, saw him at Ronnie Scott's with uh, Jason Rebello on keyboards, Vinnie Colliuta on drums, Tal Wilkenfeld on bass. Uh, it was a great gig. <coughs> but um, when he is hitting the whammy bar um, to create some pitch bends, um, you know, just like a pitch, a pitch dip rather than a pitch dive. There's a, there would be a difference. A little pitch dip would just go rather than a pitch dive, which would go. So there's there's a difference between the two techniques that he would use. Uh, he is definitely hitting some of those microtones because um, the pitch is free to move. There's nothing like a fret to impinge upon it. For example, on my fretless bass. There is no, there are no frets. Obviously, it's a fretless bass, which means I can play microtones. If I'm, if I'm prepared to to put my fingers just a little bit sharp or a little bit flat, I can play microtones, and and occasionally I do, but mostly by accident. <laughs> uh, just just by my my occasionally lazy technique. But yes, that would be that would be true. Um. Lollipop Gill says, would it be possible to use Melodyne's library of microtonal keys to learn writing music with them? If so, which direction would you point someone to setting up? I am aware of their microtonal libraries. I have no idea how they work. <laughs> so you are talking to the wrong person, but I'm sure that there is some kind of video out there. And Johnny Guybe is in the house. He says, good to see everybody made it. Uh, and it's it's just a shame that you're not here to to um, for us to be bantering as well, Johnny, because I'm I'm sure it'd be hilarious. Um, but I'm glad you're here nonetheless, uh, and I hope everything is okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see what we have in terms of questions. Uh, D flat would be in Brebeck's Turk uh, tune. Yes, Blue Rondo a la Turk. Yes, is in D flat. You're right. Um, but interestingly enough, take five is in B flat minor, which is the relative major, which is why if you're smart enough, you can play Blue Rondo a la Turk and take five at the same time. Let's see. I think we're getting towards the end or maybe not. <laughs> uh, Michael Johnson had to step away for a while. Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad you're back. The broken period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, you American folks, you call it the Baroque period, when the term is a French term, Baroque. Um, so, um, it's, you know, we kind of call it Baroque here. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting different pronunciation across the pond from here. Sometimes you guys are absolutely spot on with certain pronunciations and certain words not so much, but then I guess that's the same for us as well. You know, kind of oftentimes where you're right, we're wrong, and where we're right, you're wrong. Uh, and sometimes we're both wrong and the French are right. So in terms of the word Baroque, the French are correct. It's kind of not Baroque, and it's kind of not Baroque either. It's kind of an in-between Baroque. But anyway, that's nitpicking. Uh, Baroque music didn't sound broken, yes. Uh, Alan Pauly's sound design. I've been slowly working on the kind of ambient project. Uh, I'm basically trying to do more of a chill version of Vivaldi The Four Seasons. Cool, okay. What is the best way to negative harmonize? Interesting question, negative harmony. Negative harmony is a massive con uh, concept which I cannot go into in two minutes. But I will point you to two excellent resources for understanding negative harmony. Number one, the awesome genius that is the young man that is Jacob Collier. Uh, he has some videos on negative harmony, but he also has a great, great, great 
arrangement of In the Bleak Midwinter, where he changes key. He modulates from the key of G to the key of uh, G half sharp, which is all part of the whole negative harmony, negative harmony context, concept. That's resource number one. Resource number two is awesome bass player and musicologist Adam Neely. Go to his channel. Uh, he has, I think, two or three videos on um, negative harmony, um, where he v he is very thorough in explaining it, and it's very well worth watching it because actually he's not just a really good bass player, and he's not just a very knowledgeable musicologist, but he's also a darn good teacher. Uh, and he is not sponsoring this show in the slightest, but I just think that he is one of the best music educators on YouTube right now. Uh, other than Rick Beato. Rick Beato is also up there on the same level. Bob Studios with a $20 donation. Thank you so much. That is extremely kind of you. I really appreciate it very much. Uh, Martin says that he has to go because he's really starting to feel very unwell. Okay, Martin, you go get yourself some rest and take great care of yourself. Okay, let's see. Um, Beck is known to just bend the strings instead of retuning. Yeah, he doesn't really retune so much. Uh, negative harmony, I know you basically reverse mirror the scale. In a more chill way, I can't seem to get it to sound good for some reason. Any tips? No, not really, because I don't tend to do things n in negative harmony. But as I say, you go and uh, look at those resources... Um, and you'll find some great tips there on not only what negative harmony is, but um, how to apply it. How to apply it to music and make it sound really good. Uh, take five of the hardest song I ever did. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's, it's more challenging than it sounds. It sounds really, you know. You know, it sounds really, really simple and... You hear it in student union bars the whole world over, where you have your little jazz group that plays there on a Wednesday night, uh, and one of the tunes that gets called is Take Five. Yes. <laughs> I have been there. <laughs> I was in one of those student bands where we played Take Five, um, except one of the things that we did is that we played Take Five in five and four at the same time. <laughs> We played it with a four on the floor disco beat with the five four over the top of it. And so you get kind of this um, one chasing the chasing the one tension that resolves itself eventually. Um, and it sounds like everybody's out of time for a bit and then they come back in out of time for a bit and then they come back in. Um, but everyone's playing the same kind of eighth note value. So what we would do is we'd, we'd have a click track in our ears um, playing eighth notes with no kind of uh, just completely even eighth notes, no kind of sense of where A1 would be. Uh, and so our unifying way of counting was those eighth notes, and then we played take five over the top of that. Um, so <laughs> it was great fun to do. Not really sure you could dance to it, though. Uh, Fred says, can you put up the link for the guy who does negative harmony? Uh, you just, to be honest, Fred, you... Um, you probably really just need to, um, I'll type in, in the guy's name, uh, Adam Neely, Adam Neely, he's the bass player, musicologist, go and just do a YouTube search for him, and, uh, his, his channel will come up, it, he has tons of subscribers, and of course, Jacob Collier, if you don't know who Jacob Collier is, where have you been? That kid is awesome. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, a few people are starting to need to go home and go to bed now. Twilight Palace, we bow down, is in 6-4. Yes, it is. Uh, there are actually a couple of kind of what you'd call contemporary hymns by um, a British um, songwriter called Stuart Townend. And one of the ones that he did, uh, he wrote, was called How... How Deep the Father's Love for Us, which is in 4-4 four, four, and 6-4 alternating. 
So it starts with a bar of six, then it's a bar of four, then a bar of six, then a bar of four. Um, and uh, you'd think, oh, he's just playing with time, just, just for the sheer heck of it. No, he's not. It's to do with the meter of the lyrics that you have, the bar of six, then the bar of four. Totally justifiable. Totally justifiable. Um, and very playable, actually. 6-4 is very, 6-4 into 4-4 four, four is very easy to play. But it's 6-4 rather than two bars of 3-4, then a bar of 4-4. Four, four. The reason why it's not two bars of 3 followed by a bar of 4 is because of the way the melody is phrased. Oftentimes the shape and the phrasing of a melody will dictate how many beats in the bar you need for your song to be in. So in the case of his song, it had to be a bar of six followed by a bar of four because that's how the 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 meter of the words is set with the words that he chose and also the phrasing of the melody so melody and lyrics meter those kind of things come first and then though you you uh, allow those things to dictate to you what the time signature of your song is going to be um, if you're the kind of person that writes the words first, that's, you know, kind of that's how you need to approach time signature in that in that way, in that context. If you're like me and you do all the music and everything else first, then uh, obviously it's going to be the other way around. You're going to need to, um, you're going to be kind of hemmed in a little bit by the meter and the tempo and the time signature that you've already already chosen. And now you need to make your narrative and you need to make your words and everything else fit that meter, okay? So, yes, you do find hymns and songs that do use a couple of weird time signatures like that. Uh, good. Fred has found both of them. <laughs> and John says that he's been under a rock. Uh, Michael says, I just got a message from... Jeron tell I'll bet nobody knows who's who that is. Nope, I don't. Uh I have absolutely no idea. Would Alice in Chains be good and negative harmony? I have no idea. Um Alice in Chains are a heavy rock band. I probably would imagine they have never heard of negative harmony. And they wouldn't know what that is. They they would think you're talking some alien language. Uh, to be honest. I mean, it might well be that they are applying it intuitively, but they probably have no idea what the concept of negative harmony actually is. And if you explained it to them, they would probably either punch you or fall asleep. Or punch you, then fall asleep. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, negative harmony might be something that some people do instinctively. Like, I think Jacob was doing it instinctively before he started finding uh, stuff out about it um, and then beginning to kind of conceptualize it for himself and codify it for himself in a way that fits what he does. So there we go, I think. Fred says, yes, I've heard of him and listened to his music. Yeah, Jacob Collier uh, has some awesome uh, arrangements of songs that he's done. Um... A lot of them are, are what you call a cappella, where he just layers up miniature versions of himself and he harmonizes with himself in incredibly complex harmony. Plus, he's a multi-instrumentalist. He plays loads of instruments uh, and he writes in really quite a complex harmonic style, but it's very accessible <laughs> at the same time. That's what is really, to me, that is what is really, really cool about what he does is that it's challenging musically but it's really, really accessible. Anybody can get their ear and their head around what he's doing uh, in a really, really accessible way. And yet what he's actually doing is really quite, whoops, really quite complicated. Anyway, we are seven minutes over time. Uh, so I think we're going to wrap it there. Uh, Adam Nee did some of the game music. Yes, he certainly did. I think he's written something like 33 different games, music, music for different games. Um, yeah, he's he's actually pretty successful at that. He's a very successful composer. Um, 
And I, I think I, on either on my profile or on the songwriting page, I think I uh, linked to a couple of videos of Adams where he had taken um, Adele's Hello and then reharmonized it, but not just reharmonized it for the sake of coming up with cooler chord changes, but actually he justified each choice of chord um, to help actually enhance the narrative of that song uh, in a way that I think Adele probably wasn't really thinking of or the songwriters that wrote that for her weren't really thinking of. They were really thinking of kind of, um, you know, just like a, a cycle of four chords that could just go round and round and round um, in the verses and then, uh, you know, kind of like something else for the chorus. Um, so they weren't really thinking that way about it, but Adam really kind of took chords and made them kind of in characters that he could insert into the song, or um, he could use harmony to enhance a word or a phrase in the lyric that would help tell the story with some more detail, some more color. Uh, and it's a beautiful arrangement that he did and a beautiful reharmonization. Um, of the song and actually the vocalist that that he he hired to 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 sing it has an absolutely outstanding voice so well worth checking that out on his channel go and watch it and don't just don't just watch the music video part of it watch the explanatory part of it as well it's about 15 minutes long with the the performance being about I don't know, five, six, seven minutes of it, and then the rest of it is is his explanation for how he arrived at those decisions that he did. You will find it incredibly useful and informative, and I'm sure that you'll find that there are some things that you can take away from what he did and apply them to your own arrangements and your own productions so that you can uh, add some extra colors and extra textures and, and sounds to your palette. Because that's what makes us better songwriters, and that's what Songwriting Simplified is all about. It's about simplifying the whole process, um, boiling it down to its bare basic essentials, putting it all back together again, and making something better out of it, and stretching your songwriting skills to the max so that your songs get better and better and better. So with that, I'm going to say a good night, and I'm going to say a very big thank you to everybody for coming and asking such belting great questions and to those that donated thank you very very much it makes a big difference to me personally and to the channel and enables me to just do more make more stuff for you guys so i will see you on uh sunday for sunday night live good night everybody
was down at the famous store. Check her out into the misty dawn This is where I long